All right, so this is the introductory lecture for um, uh, Theology Sticks for Elam Bible Institute and College. Um, and tonight we're going to start by um, offering an introduction to angels. So here are the topics that we're going to cover um, in this lecture tonight. So we're going to just some introductory material for angels. We're going to talk about the different types of angels. And then we're going to talk about the nature of angels. And that's really as far as we're going to get um, tonight. And I'll just warn you before we get too far. Um, once you start studying angels, you realize that the biblical record leaves us with a really narrow picture of, of what angels are and what their function is. And, and really, you know, as you work through the biblical material, you discover that you know, a lot of the things that we believe about angels really end up being more tradition or just, you know, speculation based on, you know, a phrase or an, an interaction um, in the Bible. But probably the, the best way to, to, to have a balanced view of angels is to remember that the term angel is a functional term. It means messenger. Now, when we get to Satan, you're going to discover that Satan is not the devil's name. Satan is a functional title. So when it comes to these celestial beings, angels, demons, Satan, what you're getting are functional titles. And so the Hebrew word for messenger is malach, and the, the Greek word for messenger is angelos. And we get angel from angelos. And so really the biggest thing to remember is that angel means messenger. And I'll tell you where it really shows up. There are a couple of instances in the Old Testament where it says an angel spoke. And you read it in the context and you're like, that's Jesus. Why is it calling Jesus an angel? Is Jesus an angel? Well, it's using the term messenger. Right. A messenger came. And so unless unless the passage, the biblical passage that you're reading is clearly identifying this celestial being as. You know, Jesus present in the Old Testament or a specific angelic being. You're not going to. You're not going to do any disservice, any hermeneutical disservice if you just translate it messenger. I think that's the, the best way uh, to go. Um, but it's a functional title. So angel is just a functional title. Um, so one of the things that we know about angels is that they are immortal, but they are not eternal. Somebody tell me what they think I mean by that. They're immortal, but not eternal. So that would probably mean that they can't be killed, but they're created beings. That so, is exactly right. Yeah. God created yeah. them. But there is a there's an exception to that, Aaron. Um, okay. They, um, they are immortal, but the fallen angels, Gehenna, or the lake of fire, mm -hmm. has been reserved for them. So... Um, you would consider them immortal in the same sense that people that go to hell are immortal, but there's no, there's no life for them in that immortality. Yeah. There's just suffering, but you're exactly right. So they have mm -hmm. a beginning, right? They're created beings. And we don't just think this, but the Bible is very clear. And I'm not going to read these passages. I'm just going to reference them and you guys can, can look them up. But we know from the Old Testament, that the origin of angels lies in the creative act of God. Psalm 148 names these things that God created, the sun and the moon, the stars. And in that category of created things in Psalm 148, he lists angels. So it says, for he commanded and they were created. So we know that angels were created. But what we don't know, we don't have any biblical evidence regarding the timing of their creation we don't know when now i think that 
if you were to poll a hundred Christians that were serious about their faith and knew at least a little bit about angels, you were to poll them and you say, when do you think angels were created? I think most Christians would probably say angels were created sometime before the universe was created. That seems to be sort of an intuitive Christian answer. But the problem with that answer is we don't have any biblical basis for that answer. So we don't know when they were created. They're not mentioned in the creation narrative, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. In fact, the very first mention of angels is in Genesis 3.24, where God places a cherubim, which is a type of angel we're going to talk about in a minute, places a cherubim to guard the way to the tree of life. So this means at the very least, they were created prior to that event. But here's the other issue. We don't know how long Adam and Eve were in the garden before the fall. You know, it, when you read it in Genesis, you get this idea that they were created, they were married, they celebrated and went straight to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? But, but we don't know that. You know, it could have been hundreds of thousands or millions of years that they were in the garden before the fall. We, we just don't know the answer to that. But regarding angels, we know they were created we just don't know when. But interestingly, like humans, some angels, we have to assume maybe all angels, but at least some of them bear names, right? Gabriel, Michael. So they're so so in God's creative function, it was a personal enough creative act that he named them, which I think is really, really interesting. So they're not just they're not just celestial robots, if if you will. They are created beings. It doesn't say they're created in the image of God, like humans are, but they're created beings. And if you didn't know anything else about them, but you knew they were given names, then that certainly speaks to a higher order of creation because what the animals don't have are individual names you have cows sheep donkey right we name our pets because we care about them we you know if you if you get a puppy you name it and the reason you name it is because that's kind of your way of saying this is my puppy i'm putting sort of my thumbprint my stamp on this puppy you wouldn't just call it dog right I mean, I guess you could. That sounds like something I would do. But you wouldn't just call it dog. Um, and so the fact that angels have names speaks to a, a higher order of relationship with God. But based on what we know about, about humans, not as high in order as, as humans. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? So one of the functions of angels that we see in scriptures that they are speech agents, meaning that they speak for God, speak to people for God. Uh, a good example is when Gabriel spoke to uh, Mary at, um, at the incarnation, at, at her pregnancy. Um, we know they're held morally accountable by God. Um, we know that the fallen angels will be judged. Um, it's interesting that um, when the book of Revelation speaks about the lake of fire, it says the lake of fire reserved, reserved for the devil and his angels. So the lake of fire wasn't created for people. It was created for the devil and for angels. And so we know they'll be judged. Um, one interesting tidbit is that humans are commanded to love God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Right? The Shema. Right? We are not, however commanded to love angels we don't worship angels we don't pray to angels and we don't express worship to angels they are in many ways co-laborers in god's kingdom um, but but not infected with a sin nature like humans any questions up to this point All right, let's talk about the types of angels. 
first type of angel we uh, we see in the Bible is archangels. And there are only two references to archangels in Scripture. You have First Thessalonians 4.16 and Jude 9. And in Jude 9, Michael is specifically named. Now, we're not going to get into it. If, if this were a study of Jude, we certainly would. But um, Jude is an interesting book because Jude quotes extra biblical sources, the book of Enoch. And so, um, so you, you have some of that discussion of angels that, that we believe quite possibly Jude was pulling from the book of Enoch. And so if Jude is pulling from the book of Enoch, it lands in the book of Jude. And we consider that, you know, you know, first Timothy three sixteen says that all scripture is breathed out of God. And we believe it's Holy scripture. Then, um, does that mean Enoch is as well the book of Enoch or does it just mean that portion or, you know, but Jude nine mentions, uh, Michael, Michael is the leader of the good angels in the war against the dragon in revelation 12, seven, um, Gabriel. So Michael and Gabriel are the two angels that get the most name recognition, uh, in scripture and, People often identify Gabriel as an archangel, but the Bible doesn't identify him as an archangel. And so I don't know if you <laughs> have picked up on the pattern that, that we're dealing with in this lecture, but there's a lot of things about angels that we take for granted that we are assuming. Like we just assume that Gabriel is an archangel. But the Bible doesn't say either way. It just names him, right? And so um, what I do think we could say, though, is that if there is a hierarchy of angels, and, and I believe that there is, I think it's reasonable to assume that an archangel would be at the top of the hierarchy. And the reason I say that is because of the place given to Michael in in the end of things, in, in eschatology, right? Particularly the, uh, the book of Revelation. It's, it's Michael that is leading the other celestial beings in the war against the dragon. And so I think in the hierarchy, if, if there is, and I believe there is, um, then an archangel would stand atop that hierarchy. So the first type of angel you have is an archangel. The second type you have is just an angel, just a like a... I don't want to say regular run of the mill, but just an angel without any other titles. And I think this classification seems to be the most numerous of these celestial beings. Really good example. Luke 28, uh, 2, 8 through 15. An angel, just an angel, not Michael, not Gabriel. An angel said to them, fear not for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. So, um, most of what we see in scripture uh, when we when we talk about angels is this this type of angel. Uh, third type of angel is a seraphim. There's only one passage in the Bible that specifically mentions a seraphim, but it is extremely instructive. And it's from Isaiah 6, 1 through 6. I'm just going to read it uh, for you here. Isaiah writes, in the king, in the year King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And that's one of the most specific passages we have in the whole Bible, about any particular type of angel, and that is the seraphim. And I think that when you look at those categories of, of angels, archangels, and seraphim, or I'm sorry, when you look at seraphim and cherubim, which we're going to talk about cherubim in just a minute, what you're going to find when you read through scripture is you're going to find that, that those angels tend to be really closely associated with both the presence of God and with purifying fire. Typically, when the Bible talks about fire, it's a it's speaking of judgment. Any questions about archangels, angels, or seraphim? All right. 
cherubim, more frequently mentioned than seraphim. 1 Samuel 4, 2 Samuel 6, 2 Kings 19, Psalm 80, uh, verse 1, and Psalm 99, verse 1. Very first mention of um, a seraphim, of a, of a cherubim, rather, is uh, Genesis 3, which I covered a few minutes ago. Um, really interesting um, if you read through Ezekiel, there's a couple of different um, examples in Ezekiel uh, where he talks about cherubim or ch cherub or cherubim. And so in Ezekiel 10, uh, Ezekiel is writing about a vision and he presents the cherubim as having four faces and four wings. Later in Ezekiel 41, so that's Ezekiel 10. Four faces, four wings. And then later, in Ezekiel 41, he talks about cherubim again, but only mentions two faces. So you've got cherubim. One cherubim has four faces. Later, same, same, in, same you know, celestial being has two faces. And the, the very best explanation that I can come up with, well, let me just ask you. What do you make of that variance? If Ezekiel is describing an angelic being and he describes it the first time having four faces and the second time having two faces, what do you make of that? What's your best guess on why that would be? I would say either there's like different types of cherubim. So like God created cherubim like different ways. So there's like a variety the other thing that I would I would probably say is like I do believe when you're read when you're reading some of those passages, it's not that they're not like literal. I do believe that they're one hundred percent literal, but there's also they're also like pictures into stuff that we just don't understand. So there's something God could be communicating through that that's like the best way for like a human to understand that because because it's so yeah. like you're just getting you're getting into the spiritual realm which is very there's a lot of mystery with that and so it's yeah. like the same thing we're looking in revelation and like certain creatures look like mixes of animals and right. stuff like that so that's what i came up with too aaron either there's a couple of different, at least, right, two mm -hmm. different kinds of cherubim, or maybe this vision is is so symbol laden that we just, you know, we see we see darkly, right? Like mm -hmm. we, you know, it's it's shrouded. So, um, so I think that it's either really sim symbol laden and not as literal as we think it is, or there are different types. So. I, um, I kind of came to the same conclusion. Um, Jenny or Josh, do y'all have anything different you want to chime in there? Okay. Jenny's hiding behind the glory of the Lord over there. <laughs> All right. So some people, some theologians think that cherubim and seraphim are the same creatures, but I don't think there's enough evidence really. Um to definitively say, but I think since they're mentioned as separate creatures, I think it's more likely that they are. So that's archangels, angels, seraphim, cherubim, and the last type of celestial being that we'll just kind of, you know, give an honorary mention here um, is thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. Paul mentions them in first corinthians 15 or i'm sorry in colossians 1 15 and 16 he says he being jesus he is the image of the invisible god the firstborn of all creation for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things were created through him and for him and i'm i'm just mentioning this here because we won't really talk about thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities again. We'll talk about demons, and we'll talk about Satan, 
but we, we won't really dive into thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. Um, distinguishing between those four things, and we can tell from the context in Paul's letter to the Colossians that that thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities aren't just ideas. The, the context of the passage would suggest that they're not just ideas, but they're types of spiritual forces or beings that he is referring to. The problem for us is that it's really difficult for us to distinguish between, between these four things based on the biblical record. Now, you may find a teacher online or you may find a preacher that really believes they have the answer to what a throne, dominion, ruler, and authority is. And they, make a, they may make a really good case for it. And they may even be right. But for the purposes of, of our discussion here, all I'm going to say is that because of the passage of time and the decay of language, the best we can do is speculate about what a throne, a dominion, a ruler, and an authority is. And I'm not saying we can't know for sure. I'm just saying that to make the case, to definitively say this is what a throne, dominion, ruler, and authority is, um, it requires some interpretation because you're not going to be able to go to the biblical text and say, oh, here it is. Right. So but that's really all we're going to say about thrones, dominions, rulers and authority. So I said that we were going to talk about the types of angels. The types of angels that we're identifying are archangels, angels, seraphim, cherubim, and then this category, uh, thrones, dominions, rulers, uh, rulers and authority. Any questions about the types of angels? So every week will we be going through like each type or is it, how would that work out? Like, are no, we going to go through? That? No, we'll dive a little bit deeper, but um, this is really, so the way this course is designed is this course is really designed to, to skim the surface and to give an idea. And really, honestly, there's only so far you can go with a study of angels you can go much deeper with the study of demons, particularly because Jesus interacted with demons. And we see in the Gospels, we see demonic activity in a way that we don't really see angelic activity. Like we, we get a, a really clear picture. And from the book of Revelation, we get a really clear picture. But when it comes to angels, when, you know, when, the, when the biblical writers are writing, and they mention angels, they're they're assuming that the reader already kind of knows maybe what we don't know. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But good question. But we're not going to dig too much deeper. We'll spend quite a bit of time on spiritual gifts in in the course. We'll we'll look at demons and Satan. And, um, you know, we'll get into um, in the book book of Genesis. We'll get into the. Um, you know, the pre-flood era and the Nephilim. We're going to look in Ezekiel at, at a really popular scripture that people say is evidence that Satan was thrown from heaven. And we're going to look at that passage. Like, like So we'll spend some other time doing it. So this is really, we're not going to get much deeper than this on angels. So, but let's talk about the nature of angels. Um we, we can find enough evidence in scripture to uncover at least five as five aspects of an angel's nature. First of all, angels are spirit. Hebrews 1, 13, 14 clearly labels them as ministering spirits. So that means that the essential nature of an angel is spirit, just like John chapter four says God is spirit. So angels are spirits. Number two. Angels are often glorious in appearance. Revelation 18.1 says that the earth was made bright by the angel's glory. So angels are, are emanating the glory of heaven and God's glory, the glory of, of the eternal realm. And so when people see them, they often shone bright, right? They, they were illuminated somehow. 
Uh, number three, angels are wise, but angels are not omniscient. For instance, Gabriel appears and he interpreted Daniel's vision. But Ephesians 3.10 3, says they also learn and that their knowledge is dependent on unfolding events. So, so they're wise, but they're not all wise. They're not omniscient. Number four, angels are powerful, but they are not omnipotent. Second Peter 2.11 says they are powerful, but the power is limited. And then the last aspect of an angel's nature is that angels can be in many places, but they are not omnipresent. Job 1.7 reveals that they travel between heaven and earth, which means that they are not eternally present. All right, any questions about that? You guys hear that thunder? It's thundering out there. All right. So I'm going to stop the recording.